Today we are going to learn about stress, anxiety, and depression. And we're going to look at it within the climate of all the things that are going on in our world right now. So the focus and the objective will be to discuss stress, discuss the warning signs, and to look at what happens when your stress is not managed. We will talk about anxiety along with the signs, symptoms, and treatments associated with anxiety as well as we will discuss depression, the signs, symptoms, and treatments associated with depression as well. So what's one of the big things right now that is lingering when it comes to a current stressor? Well, it's COVID-19. And a lot of people are asking, why is COVID-19 triggering mental health issues? Well, there are a lot of reasons. People are truly switching their mindset from just living day to day to feeling as if they have to learn how to survive under some situations and circumstances. It can trigger a sense of hopelessness. It can make people feel as if they're not as secure in their employment. It definitely has caused some social withdrawal. And even as things are opening back up, individuals are still quite hesitant to try to go back and do the things that they used to do, even if it's in a different way. It can bring about loneliness. We have a lot of seniors that we're concerned about because they definitely have to be weary and mindful of what they're exposing themselves to. Individuals that live alone can have a compounded sense of loneliness. It can cause individuals to have a decreased sense of financial security. And it can bring about fear for those you love and care about if they're in a high risk category or just period. It can cause increased anxiety associated with your health, which can turn into a sense of despair, which can lead to depression. But let's go ahead and look at it a little bit further. We also have tensions and things happening related to people not feeling safe due to some of the cases of police brutality that have been um, brought up right now. We have protest. We have violence because of some of the protests. We have increased uh, things happening at the protests, whether Things are being antagonized or whatever is going on. Pretty much when people turn on the television, there's something that could be coming at them that can bring about stress and anxiety. And with racial tensions and protests, we look at things that can bring people together, but we also can look at things that can pull people apart. And those things can bring about a triggering of mental health concerns. People can be stressed and anxious and depressed surrounding these types of issues as well. So let's continue the conversation focusing in on stress. What is stress? According to our zebra here, he thinks he's losing his stripes because of stress. Well, stress can be defined as our mental, physical, emotional, and behavioral reactions to any kind of perceived demand or threat. And so many things are going on in our society right now that could check those boxes for individuals.
But what makes something stressful for someone? There are situations that have strong demands. There are situations that are imminent. There are life transitions that happening. The timing of when things happening, any deviation for the norm could make something stressful for an individual. Ambiguity. People don't like when it's in that gray area. People like for things to be black and white. Controllability and desirability also can make something stressful. But it's good to know what are your red flags or warning signs to let you know that stress could be creeping into your life. If we keep pushing ourselves, eventually something inside of us will send a red flag. It'll be a warning that stress is now becoming a problem for us. But not everybody will pay attention to those big red flags. You know, I heard someone say the other day that it wasn't a red flag. It was a banner waving. But whatever the situation is, we've got to learn to be more tuned to it. So we're going to break it down into some of the different types of warning signs that we get. Physical warning signs. That could be that tension headache that just won't go away. It could be back pain. It could be muscle aches. It could be an upset stomach, our heart beating so, so fast. It could be nail biting. Those are all physical warning signs that stress could be becoming a problem for you. Could be something else. Those are just some of the typical things that happen there are also mental warning signs. Being forgetful. Having a, a, a lack of interest in things that normally you'd be loving to do and drawn to. Increased anger. And excessive fear. Things that normally would not cause you to, you know, jump. You're jittery about everything. Think about yourself. What are some of the physical and mental warning signs that you have? But we're going to keep going because there are also behavioral warning signs. Poor concentration. Overeating or undereating are also behavioral warning signs. Poor performance at work or trying to turn into the Energizer Bunny and do everything, not being able to shut it off. Being hostile, more irritable than normal, those are all behavioral warning signs that stress may be coming a problem for you. Now this is at a point where we typically deal with these type of things. These are not things that are going to send you into any kind of major crisis, but it's about how long and how often it happens to know whether stress is handling you or you're handling your stress. Because if stress is handling you, and you're not handling your stress, then you run into the risk of having chronic stress. And some of the signs of chronic stress, once again, an appetite change. Well, it's not just a minor appetite change. It's also an appetite change that has you losing weight when you're not trying to, or gaining weight at an extremely fast pace, even for yourself. 
is an increased use of drugs, alcohol, and smoking to the point where other people in your life notice. It's conflicts at work and conflicts at home for individuals who typically are not confrontational. It's a decreased energy level or once again that energizer bunny that I talked about. But it's to the point where it also kind of looks like ma a manic episode. It's restlessness and agitation to the point of sleep disturbance. Lack of concentration and focus where it interferes with your ability to accomplish tasks that are important to you. These are some things to pay attention to, to know if your stress is no more, no longer that typical stress that you can manage, that you can deal with, but it's turning into chronic stress. Something else that stress, chronic stress can lead to, there are illnesses associated with chronic stress. You have cardiovascular disease which can lead to heart issues. You have strokes, immune disorders, asthma, and diabetes can be exacerbated due to chronic stress. Chronic stress can have individuals having major panic attacks. Things like irritable bowel syndrome, and arthritis and cancer you become more susceptible to when you have chronic stress going on in your life. So we've identified some things associated with stress because you hear so many people say, oh, I'm stressed out. Oh, gosh, I can't deal with this. And typically people can end up uh, in the emergency room dealing with chest pains and it turns out to be a panic attack or they could be having some other psychosomatic symptoms that are not connected to a medical condition but they're connected to stress so learning these things can help you manage your stress instead of your stress managing you but if you don't get a handle on stress, it can snowball more into either one of these. You can begin to deal with anxiety and or depression. And there are things that say anxiety and depression are believed to stem from the same biological vulnerabilities, which include stress. And sometimes when looking at them, somebody could be dealing with stress that turns into anxiety. But when that anxiety becomes intolerable and you can, you, it's just like the aliveness begins to shut down, then you can turn that anxiety can add depression to the equation. Not that the anxiety has gone away but now you've added depression and anxiety or your stress could lead you into a depressed state but when that depression becomes intolerable and aliveness demands a release meaning that it is kind of morphing into something else it can morph into that anxiety that anxiousness that overwhelmed feeling and that depressed person now has to deal with anxiety. Whichever way it goes, we know that depression and anxiety feed off of each other. So it's important to get stress under control because it can lead to either one of these. But let's talk a little bit about just one. Anxiety. Some anxiety and worry is normal. If you're going to give a speech, you can have a little bit of that warning sign with the stomach issue. Some people have to throw up before they give big speeches or have a big performance. Some people have to go to the bathroom, but it's just those moments of upset that fuel them to be able to go and do what they need to do. And then they're fine. There's some people that go 
through this what if syndrome. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? But they're able to kind of calm themselves and look at the reality and that what if thing doesn't stifle them from getting things done. These normal amounts of anxiety can actually help you respond to threats and feel motivated to get things done. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the U.S. It affects 18.1% of the population that is aged 18 years and older every year. Anxiety disorders are highly treatable, yet only 36.9% of those suffering will even receive treatment. What are some of the emotional symptoms of anxiety? There can be feelings of apprehension and dread, feeling tense and jumpy, that anticipation of the worst, watching for signs of danger. Those are some of those emotional things that happen when you are dealing with anxiety. But there are also some physical symptoms, the pounding heartbeat, the sweaty hands, the dizziness, the shortness of breath, tremors and twitches when that leg starts to twitch and you can't stop it, that eye muscle starts to twitch. Insomnia is another physical symptom, as well as diarrhea. There are a lot of ways that our body is telling us something is not right. And that can lead to anxiety and panic attacks if not addressed. A surge of overwhelming panic, a feeling of losing control or going crazy. You can have heart palpitations or chest pain, feeling like you're actually going to pass out. You can have that trouble breathing sensation or choking sensation. That hyperventilation where you see that individual does grab that brown bag to breathe in. You can have a sense of feeling detached or not real, not connected. That everything around you is just moving and you are being consumed. It can be a real feeling. Some have said as if they thought they were going to die. But the key is, it's really just the feeling. There is nothing medical going on that you can't undo by just calming yourself and telling yourself what's the truth of the situation. There are some at-risk behaviors that can make you more prone to having an anxiety or panic attack. We talked about that what if game. And if you can rein it in, you can go ahead and function and do what you need to do. But if you play it ongoing and never ending, it can have you in a tizzy that can lead to a panic attack. Holding in your feelings, having that negative self-talk, which sets us up for failure. It can also mess with our self-esteem. You can think you're not worthy. You can have too much pressure on yourself to be perfect. And we know to the idea of being perfect is unrealistic. I tell people don't strive for perfection. Strive for excellence. You can reach excellence but you will always find something wrong when you're striving for perfection. Focusing too much on self versus others, not taking care of yourself overall, not exercising, allowing yourself to give in to phobias instead of addressing them and telling yourself the truth about those situations and circumstances as well, put you at a higher risk for having a panic attack. But there's hope. Be 
because as I said before anxiety is very treatable one of the great treatment strategies is to challenge our negative thoughts write down your worries create an an actual anxiety worry period I have my clients literally some of them set a timer give yourself 10 minutes 15 minutes to worry over whatever it is and then you've got to stop and just like you were, wrote down that worry list then you write down what's the truth of the situation seeing it in black and white is an actual calming pr process you've got to learn to accept uncertainty we don't know everything we can't control everything but learn to control the things that you can taking care of yourself is a great way to treat anxiety if you practice relaxation techniques they're very calming adopting healthy eating habits is also great you cannot ignore the benefit of getting good sleep it really helps for those dealing with anxiety and also having a regular exercise routine it is a great benefit in helping to have that routine to have that outlet of energy because those exercise endorphins can help your mood which can help you be in a better position to be intentional about dealing with the anxiety instead of the anxiety dealing with you let's talk about some other treatment strategies don't assume that things are hopeless or will never change don't engage in emotional reasoning like uh, because I feel awful my life is terrible and nothing is gonna ever get better that's not true don't assume responsibility for events which are outside of your control control the things that you can and the things that you can't you've got to learn to let go don't blame yourself or others feelings or behaviors you can only be accountable for your own feelings and behaviors and they have to be accountable for theirs do not self-medicate it is a temporary fix once the once the substance is out of your system your situation and problem is still there so something that you should do is talk therapy talk therapy is a great option to help combat anxiety anti-anxiety medications may be helpful as well it depends on what your condition is what other treatment options you need you may need intensive outpatient treatment you may need inpatient treatment you could need partial hospitalization or talk therapy could be enough the point is it's very treatable and responds well to it if you put in the work the time and the energy to address it and not ignored that is anxiety it's all about a lot of it what you're telling yourself and most times we're telling ourselves the opposite of what is true land on truth and it'll do a whole lot to help you treat it let's talk about depression now what is depression now depression is different from normal sadness engulfing your day-to-day -day life interfering with your ability to work study eat sleep or even have fun the feeling of helplessness hopelessness worthlessness are intense and unrelenting and it doesn't seem like there's any relief in sight you truly feel consumed by doom that's how people have described it what is major depressive disorder the leading cause of disability in the United States for people aged 15 to 44 is major depressive disorder 
About 6.7% of the, U the U.S. population age 18 and order are given this diagnosis each year. While major depressive disorder can develop at any age, the median age at onset is typically 32 years old. And it's more prevalent in women than in men. A lot of those numbers have to do with those who are actually going in and get treated because we know women are more likely to address their health issues than men are. Unfortunately, we both, both genders, all people need to address whatever is going on with them physically and mentally. Let's talk a little bit more about depression. So, signs and symptoms of depression. You can have a feeling of helplessness and hopelessness. You can have a loss of interest in your daily activities. The idea of getting up, taking a shower can be just like mind-boggling and too much. Your appetite or weight changes. Once again, it can be over or under eating in this as well. Sleep changes, either sleeping the day away or if you're dealing with manic episodes, not sleeping at all. A loss of energy, easily angered and irritated. You can have a self-loathing when you're depressed where you just feel that you're worthless and that there's nothing you can do right. It can also lead to reckless behavior. If you self-medicate, you may be more apt to drink and drive when you're in this depressed state. When you are having these signs and symptoms, pay attention to them. Don't ignore them. Here's some more. There's a general neglect of self. You can be unkempt and not even really be attuned to that fact. You don't just neglect appearance, but you can begin to neglect responsibilities. Your memory can be impacted. Your ability to concentrate and think clearly can be gone. You can have suicidal thoughts. Your feelings and behaviors can be dulled or numbed. You can have difficulty making decisions. And you can just have an overall negative attitude and outlook on life. But let's look at some risk factors related to depression. Loneliness is a big risk factor. And we find ourselves isolating we can feel as if we have a lack of social support. We won't tap into it. But there are actually some people out there that don't have a good network of support. They're at a greater risk. Because even if you don't tap into your support system, if you have one, they're apt to check on you. A recent stressful life experience. Well, we're surrounded with that right now. And then you have just real life stuff like death. You have people who have to relocate. We have people who lose jobs. All of those things can make put you at risk for depression. There could be a family history of mental health issues. Early childhood trauma and abuse also puts you at risk for depression. There is the, uh, if you have heard of it, the ACEs, which is the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which has a list of things that if you were exposed to in your childhood and there was no meaningful intervention done, it can come back and impact you in your adult life. And depression is one of the things that can come about. If there is a history of substance abuse, for yourself or for your family, that puts you at a higher risk. And overall health problems, especially chronic pain, can put you at risk for depression. But as I said at the start, 
You don't have to feel hopeless if this is something you or someone you care about is struggling with during these times or just during life in general. Treatment options are there. Depression does not have to be tolerated as a lifelong condition. The cure may not be as difficult as you might think. Actually, just a few basic lifestyle changes can help you break free from your depressed moods. Medication. These are some of the common ones that you see, Zola. Paxo, Prozac. Antidepressants can help ease symptoms of depression while helping a person return to normal functioning. Antidepressants are not habit forming. Medication may be a short term or a long term treatment option. It just depends on the severity of symptoms and other medical conditions and each individual circumstances. However, it often takes time and patience to find the drug that works best for you. One of the things that I talk to my patients about, because everybody has different reactions to the idea of taking psychotropic medications, when someone comes in for a therapy session and if they are too far gone with their depression, talk therapy is not the place to start alone. Talk therapy in conjunction with medication management is what's needed sometimes. One of the examples I give them is say for example, someone sitting at the bottom of a well stuck. They're down in that well and somebody drops a rope down. The individual doesn't have enough energy and motivation or desire to even grab that rope. So then they put a ladder down so the person can maybe climb out. It won't take so much work and energy to, to try to shimmy up a rope. They cannot even inch towards the ladder to begin to crawl up. That rope and that ladder represents talk therapy. When you are so clinically depressed, there are times when talk therapy will just wash over you because you are not receiving it and you can't do the work. So that's when medication management comes in. It gives you that boost that you need to be able to hear, receive, and begin to do the work. And as I said previously, for some people, that's a temporary period of time that you take it to get you where you need to be, where you can fully engage in talk therapy and get better. For some people, you're going to get to a maintenance level where you're going to need that medication ongoing in addition to the talk therapy to help you be good. Whether you need it for six weeks, six months, six years, or 60 years, it should not matter. As long as it's helping you to function and be the person that you need to be, that's all that matters. If someone told you that you needed medication for a heart condition or for diabetes, you would take it. And it's, this should be the same way with your mental health medications. Don't have an adverse relationship with psychotropic medication. Go ahead and accept it. Get better, whether it's short term or long term. There's nothing wrong with having to take the medication to help you. Counseling can help many depressed people understand themselves and cope with their problems. You have interpersonal therapy that works to change relationships that affect depression. Cognitive behavioral therapy helps people change the negative thinking and behavior patterns that can impact depression. You know, that 
diagram that shows you the thought. What we think affects how we act and feel. Very true. So when you're having a negative thought, it makes sense that you're going to have negative feelings, negative emotions, along with negative behaviors. The same goes true if you're having a negative feeling. What we feel affects what we think and do. So if your emotions are negative, it's going to affect your thinking and it's going to affect your behavior. Well, if you're acting out in a negative way, what we do affects how we think and feel. So those negative actions, that negative behavior is going to lean to, into negative thinking and negative emotions. But guess what? The same is true if you switch to being positive. So positive thinking can lead to positive emotions, positive behaviors and actions. Positive emotions can lend to positive thinking and positive behavior. They feed on each other. So when someone tells you to change your negative self-talk, it's because that negative self-talk is feeding into negative thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. So switch it over to positive. Cognitive behavior therapy works wonders for individuals dealing with depression and anxiety. As with most conditions, the type and level of treatment varies depending upon many other factors. Hospitalization may be needed as well as partial, intensive support groups and various other modalities. Tap into whatever you need to help. Don't begrudge an inpatient stay if that's what you need. If you start out in the emergency room and that turns into intensive outpatient therapy, be okay with it. There's goes from low intensity care to high intensity care. But the key is to get whatever care you need. If you are someone you know has had at least five of the symptoms that I'm going to list for more than two to three weeks, I encourage you to get them help or for you to get help now. If you're constantly feeling tired, if there's a noticeable lack of motivation, if you're dealing with anxiety and restlessness that can sometimes lead to panic attacks, if you're having muscle and joint pain that's not connected to another health condition, if you're having intestinal or gastro issues that are not connected to another health condition, if you find yourself with frequent headaches, once again, not connected to another health condition, if you find yourself all of a sudden have a lack of interest in intimacy and communication and partnership with your relationships that you're in, if you have recurring thoughts of no longer wanting to live or wanting to harm yourself, if you find yourself withdrawing from friends and family, these are not typical things that you should be dealing with. If these things have been going on for more than two or three weeks, start with talking to somebody. You all have an employee assistance program and it costs you nothing. So that's a first step in getting help now. Okay. And if it's someone that you love, if they're in your household, they can use your EAP. If they're employed someone else, somewhere else, they may have their own EAP they can tap into. The bottom line is to do something. Some of the ways to help you stay good are to ask yourself these questions on a regular basis. Do you make time each day for yourself? Carving out me time is not a selfish thing. It is a self-care thing. Are you getting the emotional support that you need? You can't continue to pour out and give and take care of everyone else if you're not getting support and care for yourself. 
Are you taking care of your body? This is the vessel we have to get around and we've got to do our best to take care of it in every way. Are you overloaded with responsibility? You are one person. You cannot be everything for everybody. It's okay to say no sometimes. Do you ask for help when you need it? Asking for help is not weak, it's wise. Do you know how to bring your life into balance? You've got to learn how to have a great work-life balance so that you can live and not just be existing. Stress, anxiety, and depression, they hurt. But you don't have to. Use your employer paid EAP benefit when and if needed. You can have telehealth video sessions or telephone sessions during this time of social distancing and even after. This benefit is for you and anyone in your household. Whether they are related to you or not, they just need to live at your address in order to use the benefit. So with all the information that has been provided today, you may have questions. So you can email your questions to concern at bmhcc.org. That's concern at bmhcc.org. And just ask whatever questions you have. You can reference this training if you would like or not. It really doesn't matter. We are here to provide assistance when and if needed. No issue is too big or too small. It's always confidential and it's always free for you and anyone who lives in your household. So be proactive and not reactive if you can help it. Call 901-458-4000 or you can call our 1-800 number. That's 1-800-445-5011. This is your employee assistance benefit. Use it if you need it. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And I hope you have learned at least one thing that will be helpful to you or to someone you love and care about. Bye-bye.